words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. As, as Gary mentioned, I was involved in the planning of the conference and I argued against the TED style 18 minute talks. And so I'm gonna embody that protest uh, here, here today. Um, <laughs> uh, my title today is uh, Living in a Material World with an Immaterial God. And uh, it's strange to think, isn't it, that the most important person in our life is someone we've never seen? The most significant relationship that any of us have with the God of the universe is someone that we cannot see. He's invisible, the invisible, immaterial one. Of course, we can, we can sense God's presence from time to time. Uh, we can see his effects in our lives and in the lives of others. Uh, we can experience him through the people of God and through other means of grace. But we don't, as Paul uh, says, we don't see face to face in this life. We, we, we see God through a, a dimly lit mirror. We, we walk by faith, uh, not by sight. Paul says, uh, it's better, uh, or while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, of course, Jesus was incarnate in a physical body, but we don't have sense perceptual access to his physical form. In this life, uh, we, we walk by faith. And when Thomas uh, wouldn't believe in Jesus unless he saw him and put his fingers in uh, Jesus' nailed scarred hands, uh, Jesus says to Thomas, uh, Thomas, you believe because you've seen? Blessed are those who believe even though they haven't seen. Peter, some 35 years after this scene, writes to his churches, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you don't see him now, you trust in him. And, and the question is, how do we love and trust someone that we cannot see. And, and here's where our materiality, being embodied human persons in a material world, and God's immateriality can become problematic in our spiritual life. And I'd like to propose that without an adequate understanding, without an adequate understanding, the immateriality, the invisibility of God can become problematic in developing our communion with him. Now, let's be clear, the problem is not on God's side. God has no problem interacting with the material world. The Lord of all is the Lord of space and time. He made atoms. He made molecules. He made quarks. If there's strings, then he made strings. God is comfortable and familiar with physical reality. He, he made it. He can interact with it. If, if Jesus could walk through walls... No doubt he has no trouble in dwelling our physical bodies. So the problem is not on God's side. In fact, it's interesting, isn't it, that as a particle physicist scratch their way down to the fundamental constituents of reality, th these fundamental particles, they, they, they don't sound very physical. They're, they're unobservable. Uh, they're, they're, they don't behave like normal physical objects. Uh, they have immense power. They're something like energy, the physicists tell us. And it sounds a lot like in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word spoke reality into existence. See, the Christian view is, of matter is that underneath matter is the intentional power of God, the Word of God, that said, let there be, and there was. This Word of God that brought reality into existence and sustains it. So the problem's not on God's side. He's perfectly comfortable interacting in a physical, material world. The problem, as in so many cases, is on our side. And the problem is, one way to put the problem, is that most of us are addicted to materiality. It's not necessarily materialism, though that's a problem, but we are addicted to, we are focused on, we are distracted by what we can see, what we can touch, what we can smell, what we can hear, what we can taste. The materiality of the world 
is oftentimes what we're focused on at the expense of the immaterial one, our immaterial, loving, heavenly Father. It's difficult for us to even have a conceptualization of what it would be to interact with an immaterial reality. As Madonna famously sang, um, I am living in a material world. Not, not Jesus' mother, the Madonna, the more recent one. <laughs> I'm living in a material world and I am a material girl, uh, or boy as the case may be. We often say, out of sight is out of mind. And unfortunately, if Jesus is out of sight, then it can be very easy for him to become an occasional, fleeting, vague thought. And so how is it that we can begin to develop a conceptualization, a way of understanding what it is to interact with an immaterial God and cultivate that relationship? Recently, I was in my office, and a, and a student came in and just last week, and he, he told me about a title of a book that he'd come across. Now, he'd come across this book title. He hadn't read the book yet, but he came across the title, and he was uh, just kind of attracted to the title. And it was a, a, a book that Dallas referenced in The Spirit of the Disciplines. And the title was The Seeming Unreality of the Spiritual Life. The Seeming Unreality of the Spiritual Life. And I said, you know, that's interesting. I'm, I'm talking about that next week. So I went to my library at Biola University, and they had the book. Here it is. I checked it out. And uh, this is one of those books uh, written by Henry Churchill King. It was written in 1908. It's one of those books that you pick up and you think, how in the world did King have access to Willard's ideas in 1908? That's amazing. And there's a lot in there that sounds a lot like Dallas. In fact, he says at one point, Though by hypothesis, God is the, one of the realest, or the one realest of all facts and the most loving of all beings. He does not seem to be thrust upon us as such at all. After all is said, is this not the real and great difficulty for the Christian view and for the establishment of real conviction and of joyful spiritual living? Does not much depend upon meeting effectively this constant underlying difficulty of the seeming unreality of the spiritual life? See, that's it. The spiritual life can, can seem unreal to us. We can get distracted like Martha by so many other things. So we need a conceptualization. We need a way of understanding the invisible reality of life with God. And here, as in many other cases, Jesus is our teacher. In what uh, New Testament scholars call Jesus' final discourse in the last few uh, chapters of John's Gospel, in John 16, he, he actually says to his disciples, it's better that I leave you. It's to your advantage. Because if I go, I'll send the spirit, the helper, the paraclete to you. Now, it's interesting to think about why was it better for the physical incarnate Jesus to leave in order for him to send the spirit? Well, there's lots to say about that. It looks like part of God's method with us is to make room for us to seek him. And so he doesn't force himself or thrust himself upon us. But another thing to think about here is that, of course, when Jesus was embodied and incarnate here on earth, he could only be at one place at a time. When Jesus was with Peter, James, and John, he wasn't with Nathaniel and Philip. When he was in Galilee, he wasn't in Capernaum. But when he sends the Spirit, he says, I will not leave you as orphans, and the Spirit will remain with you forever. And the Spirit is multiply realizable. The Spirit can be with me, he can be with you, he can be with my wife in Long Beach, and with Christians all over the globe. And so one benefit of Jesus sending the Spirit is the Spirit can be with everyone and be with us always. But Jesus goes on to talk about the ministry of the Spirit in John 16. I love this passage. He says, I still have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, stop right there for a second, because this is an interesting psychological point, right? Jesus was the master teacher, and as he's teaching along here in his final discourse, he realizes, oh, they can't take anymore. They can't bear anymore. They're overwhelmed. They're flooded. They, they, they've heard too much already. Have you ever been in that situation where I just can't take anymore? Now, as a, as a university professor who lectures a lot, I take great solace in the fact that Jesus noticed they couldn't bear anymore, and then he keeps talking. In, in fact, he goes on for a chapter and a half, according to John's record of it, 
And uh, so I often look at my students and I say, wow, it looks like you guys need a break. Well, we'll go for about another hour and uh, then, you'll, then you'll get that break. And I didn't realize it, but I was just being like Jesus with that. <laughs> but he goes on to say something pretty profound here. He says, I still have many more things to say, a lot more truth to give you that you need to know, you need to understand, you need to internalize it, but you can't bear it anymore. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Spirit. And he'll guide you into all truth. He'll take what is mine and declare it to you. See, the Spirit knows what we can bear, and the Spirit is going to indwell us as believers, and he is going to take what Jesus had and declare it to us. And Paul says, you know, one of the people who, who knew this ministry of the Spirit best, Paul says that the Spirit of God is crying out in our hearts. He's declaring in our hearts, Abba, Father. Elsewhere in Romans, he says the Spirit is testifying with our spirits that we're children of God. It looks like the fundamental declaration of the Spirit is that we are beloved children of God. And, and one way to think about this is that God is going to transform us through spirit and word. And that shouldn't surprise us, because another way to think about spirit and word is presence and meaning. See, spirit is personal presence. The spirit mediates the presence of the Father and the Son. And he speaks truth. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. Word is a vehicle of meaning. And so what the Spirit does, and what God does by saying the Spirit, is he takes his presence and his meaning and he indwells us with it. See, presence and meaning are transformational. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, presence by itself can be a little disturbing. If someone came to the front of the room here and just stood with their hands by their side and a blank stare on their face and didn't have a badge on and kind of nondescript clothes, we, we would have presence, but we wouldn't have meaning. We wouldn't know what they're thinking. And it would be disturbing, right? We'd think, what is this person's intentions? Why are they there? Presence without meaning is disturbing. Meaning without presence can leave us lonely. I think a good example of this is when we maybe find an old letter from a, a friend who's no longer in our life or, a, or someone who's uh, deceased. And we read the meaning, but the person isn't there. We have the meaning, but we long for the person who, who had those words for us. See, presence without meaning is disturbing. Meaning without presence can leave us lonely, but when we have presence and meaning together, it's powerful. If my little girl came in this room right now, she would just run right past all of you, and she'd come running up on this stage to give me a big hug. But if I, if I pointed at her and said, Sienna, what are you doing? Get out of here! Right? My little girl wouldn't be able to make it past the front row my presence and that meaning would, would just crumple her to the ground. Now, on the other hand, if, if, as she's running towards me, I jumped down the stage and I picked her up and I swung her around and said, I love you, honey. You would see this big smile come across her face because my presence and that meaning would form her. I remember once I was uh, pushing my son on the swing in our backyard. I always loved uh, swing time with my kids because I could take my iPhone out in my other hand and check my email while I was, uh, and it was multitasking. And, and one day I was doing this and I was pushing my son and, and he was, he's about four or five because he's learning to tell time. And he said, Dad, will it ever, he said, Dad, what time is it? I said, so, well, 1.30. He said, Dad, will it ever be 1.30 again? And I said, oh yeah, well, it depends what you mean, you know, 1.30 a.m. tonight and then 1.30 p.m. again tomorrow and then it goes on and on. He said, no, Dad, that's not what I mean. Will it ever be this time again? Now, I have a PhD in philosophy, and philosophers, you know, they wait for their kids to ask these kinds of questions. So my phone went in my pocket, and, 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 I, and I said, son, do you mean will it ever be this particular moment in time again? This particular moment? Yeah, Dad. No. I said, son, this, this moment right here, gone. And this moment that we have together right now, it's gone. And as I was playing with my son in that way, I, I think I realized, and I know he realized, wow, we'll never have this moment again. And I said, you know what that makes me want to do, son? That makes me want to make sure I take advantage of every moment we have. And as he came back in the swing, I said, you know what that makes me want to do right now? It makes me want to tell you, I love you. And as I pushed him, I saw his little four-year-old back kind of quiver, right? Because my presence and that meaning dropped down into his soul. 
and there was an explosion of goodness. And so we shouldn't be surprised that, that God's method of transformation is to bring spirit and word, presence and meaning, and drop it down into the core of our being, and the spirit's going to cry out, Abba, Father, you are a beloved child of God. So when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit is going to cry out and testify that we are children of God. And so what the disciplines are then on this view is they're embodied space-time ways in a material world to pay attention to the immaterial reality of God, to be present with the one who is present with us. Or another way to say the same thing, the disciplines are embodied practices in a physical world whereby we present ourselves to the immaterial reality of the spirit's presence and meaning. Um, you know, I left my wife yesterday to drive up here and, and uh, I say goodbye to her there in the driveway. And if I got home on Friday and when I see her, I say to her, hey, honey, it's great to see you. I haven't thought of you one time since I pulled out of the driveway. <laughs> now, I'd be in trouble, not so much with my wife, but I would be in trouble. If, if I'm not cultivating my relationship with my wife when she's out of sight, then I am missing out on what it is to be in a relationship with a person. It's the same thing in our spiritual lives. And the disciplines help us stay with the God who is. There's this great little verse in Jude 21. Jude doesn't get enough attention these days. In Jude verse 21, there's a little phrase that says, keep yourselves in the love of God. See, that's what the spiritual disciplines do. They, they keep us in the love of God. We're embodied persons in a material world, and we need to practice to stay with him. There's this quote I ran across. I don't know if you can read it. Um, probably can, but I just took a picture of the inside cover of this book. I don't even remember what this book was. If anyone knows, I'd love to know what the book was, but it's a quote by W.H. Auden. He says, choice of attention, to pay attention to this and ignore that, is to the inner life what choice of action is to the outer. In both cases, man is responsible for his choice and must accept the consequences. As Ortega y Gasset said, tell me to what you pay attention and I'll tell you who you are. You see, through the disciplines, we pay attention to the immaterial one. We pay attention to the presence and meaning of the spirit who's crying out in our hearts, Abba, Father. As we live in a material world with an immaterial God, we have a choice of what to pay attention to. And Paul puts it like this. If you have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. For your life is over. And your life, your zoe, is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you'll also appear with him in glory. And that is when we will see face to face. But in the meantime, in a material world, as embodied beings, we engage practices to set our minds on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Thank you.